Yeah, because if we're not, that would be a shame. Oh, and we are. Okay, I'm going to tweet that we're live. Perfect. That's so awkward, Max. It's such an awkward pause that you're doing this right I now. I know. Dude. That's the problem every time. Every time I start oh, one of these streams, wow. I have to like bridge the gap. It's really awkward, but oh, that's what it is. I'm watching us live on Twitter right now. That's very <laughs> weird. Okay. <laughs> I'm backwards. <laughs> so, Emma, welcome to the show. How are you doing? How's your day been? I'm fantastic. How are you? My day's been great. How was your day? Uh, my day's just got much better, I have to say. Um, I'm really looking forward to this interview, actually. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, why don't we start with... Why don't you tell everybody who you are, for those of the like the two people that are, aren't aware yet. Um, who are you? What do you do? Where do you live? Um, what's your social security number? What's... Um, <laughs> That too, if you want to get hacked. Everybody already uh, knows that after Equifax, right? After the hack. I feel like I should give you some fun facts that. that people don't know. Oh, that um, would be amazing. Give us some okay, fun cool, facts. Okay, cool. But then you have to reciprocate. So, okay. So, oh, hey, I'm Emma. I um, <laughs> troll the internet on a daily basis. I am an American software engineer living in Germany. I talk really fast. Um, so please just like yell at me if you need me to slow down. I currently work at LogMeIn as a software engineer. Before that, I was at IBM. And I will be moving to Stockholm, hopefully in July, if things permit, um, to work as a software engineer at Spotify. Did I say Spotify already or Stockholm? They're I think you said experts. Stockholm, but congratulations okay, anyway. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's see. Fun fact. Um, I don't know if this is a fun fact, but literally everything I own is covered in cat hair. Um, <laughs> Classic cat lady life. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't know. Do I have any other weird things? Uh, no. I, uh, yeah, I mean, they'll probably come out in the course of this conversation, but I want to hear a fun fact about you. Uh, well, fun fact about me. I once accidentally set my parents' toilet on fire. That's a fun fact about me that not everybody knows. But I don't think you should explain why. I think you should make people work for it. Yeah, I no, know I'm why. definitely not going to explain why. I did not ever set anything on fire, but I did put out fires because I was in the fire department. So that's my fun fact. I would have arrested Max as a civil <laughs> arrest. Is that a thing? Probably. <laughs> Citizen, citizen's arrest. <laughs> so I guess actually that's a good starting point. What did, where, where did you start? What is sort of the beginning of Emma Boston? So I was born in 1993. I... No, I'm not going to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I grew up in upstate New York and I grew up as the child of two IBMers. Technically, I'm a third generation. My grandpa also worked for IBM. Oh, what? That's a fun said, fact. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think he built vacuum tubes, but he could have just been lying to me because during grandparents week at school, he told all my classmates he was friends with Abraham Lincoln, which was physically impossible. And yet we all believed <laughs> it. So he could be lying to me. But yeah, I'm a third generation. Um, my dad is a senior architect and back end dev. Um, I don't know what he does. Uh, but my mom just <laughs> retired after like 30 years as a lead UX designer or something like that. Um, and so I went to school in Albany, New York, same college as John Papa, if you know him. For sure. And yeah, I started out as a bio major, quickly realized I sucked at it <laughs> and uh, almost failed college my first semester. Had a midlife crisis, thought I was going to transition to music education. And then my dad was like, you definitely should not do that. And I was like, you know what? You're probably right. And so I, I stayed at Siena College and I declared a compute. Well, I declared an actuarial science major and um, studied like statistics and computer science. Um, and that's where I kind of took my intro to programming class and I loved it. So I switched into computer science with business. Um, so you didn't actually graduated. start out wanting to be a computer scientist or wanting no, to study computer science? No, never. It was one of those like, yeah, fuck it. I'm good at it. Um, I was decently good at it. We'll leave it at that. Um, I really liked logic puzzles and I liked creativity. I really wanted to mesh like music with analytics or like logic, think logical thinking. Um, and so it's kind of ironic now that I'm joining Spotify because I do literally get to do those together. Um, but yeah, I think it was one of those of like, well, you know, I think I'm pretty good at it and I like it. So why not? Did you do any of that before you went to college just because your parents yeah. or something? Well, I did have a really nice looking MySpace page. Amazing. Um, 
Amazing. Um, and I played, uh, no, The Sims is not programming. So no, I guess I, did, I didn't have any experience. I think The Sims is pretty far-fetched. I would have kind of like Neopets, but The Sims. I never had a Neopet. I always wanted real pets. I am way too <laughs> young for Neopets. <laughs> oh yeah, you're a little baby. I forgot. Oh, that's mean. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So you, you go to university, you start studying biology. Um, how, how did you realize you didn't like it and why did you choose it before that? Because I was that? failing all my classes. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, my whole life I wanted to be an OBGYN. Like I wanted to deliver babies for a living. So I wanted to be a doctor who, I don't know why, what, like five-year-old looks at babies and is like, I want to deliver those when I'm older. Um, but I did and I was obsessed with it. And then I got to college and realized that biology for me was not medicine. I know you need to understand biology, chemistry to go into it, but it just wasn't what I was expecting. And so I really was not motivated to study. And so I didn't study and I did really badly and um, it was not going to be sustainable. That makes sense. Nice. All right. Yeah. So you, you drop out of, you know, you don't drop out of, you, you switch major to <laughs> actuary science. Is that what you said? Actuarial. Yeah. I have no idea what that word means. I'll be honest. I don't either. I think so. Actually, Amazing. <laughs> um, actuarial science. I'm going to Google it. It's basically like what I don't know. You know, what? I'm going to wait to Google this because, um, because there's going to be someone watching this who's like, she's totally wrong. Okay. It applies mathematical and statistics. It applies statistics um, to assess risk insurance, finance, and other industries. So like oh. these are the people who determine the risk factor for a 16 year old male driving a red car and like what percentage in, or like what is their insurance rate that they're going to have statistically based on how more are they more likely to crash than someone else um so that's what I wanted to do because I loved math I always really loved math um but then I realized calculus is terribly hard <laughs> and that kind of math never sat well with me so when I switched into computer science it was more about automata and logic gates, XOR, OR gates, AND gates, um, Boolean logic. Those are the kinds of things I really, really love. But I, again, did really bad with calculus and statistics. Yeah, fair enough. All right. So let's keep going with this story. You you start studying computer science. Do you, is it love at first sight? Do you switch to a computer science major and immediately go, this is the best thing ever? This fits me like a glove? It was Ada Lovelace at first sight. Oh my God, I hate myself. Oh, oh, that is so good though. Burn, program. Ah, how did I not yeah. think of that? That is so good. Damn. We can't all be nice or yeah. we can't all be cool like me. Um, so Yeah, I loved it. I remember there was a day where we learned binary and we learned hexadecimal and we learned octal and how to kind of like, not compile, but to translate between all three of them. And that was the day I was like, oh, I love this. Like learning how, what is a base 10 decimal system? What does that even mean? Um, and we got to do really cool things. Like we created, um, I think it was 64 bit memory out of a breadboard and um, different chips and wires and stuff. That was really, really cool. But my hands hurt like hell by the end of it. <laughs> Um, because I programmed the whole thing and then by the end realized my circuit board wasn't working. So I had to like take everything off and redo it. Um, so yeah, it was definitely something that like from day one, I definitely loved. Nice. All right. So you're in, in college, you eventually graduate. What, what happens next? How does the story continue? Um, so my junior year, I was studying abroad in London for three months and I got a message from my dad's friend, who was a hiring manager at IBM, and he said, hey, do you want to apply for this internship? I have openings. So I applied, and I interviewed, and I got accepted. And so that summer, the summer after my junior year, okay, it was between my, my third and fourth years of my bachelor's degree, I went to Poughkeepsie, to IBM Poughkeepsie, and I did an internship in WebSphere automation. Um, so I automated the installation of ZOS no, automated the installation of WebSphere application server on ZOS using Python. It's a lot. I had to memorize that for my resume. Um, and so, yeah, it was all, it was in test automation. It was using Python. And it was during that internship where my dad's old manager, who was his manager for years, um, she went to go visit him and she said, hey, like, how's your daughter doing? And he goes, well, she's sitting downstairs. Why don't you go talk to her? So she came down and talked to me. I was like, would you be interested in moving to Austin, Texas? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? Like never planned to move to Texas, uh, but why not? And I interviewed for a role and I got hired full time for when I got graduated. So it was, 
it was a pretty seamless transition between like college and and the real world. Nice. Did you keep working on uh, WebSphere, ZOS, no. Python things? No, no. I joined um, the um, Spectrum Control team, so it was uh, enterprise storage software, and I worked on the on-prem and cloud offerings. So I did a lot of chart works using Dojo. Uh, not my favorite work. Um, I did actually learn a lot about accessibility at that time. So my main role was to work on web accessibility for the two products. Um, but nice. it just wasn't something that was my passion. And so I remember talking to my manager, she could tell I wasn't really interested in it. And she said, if you want to look around internally for a new role, like I support you. And so a year after I joined that team, I got a message from a VP of systems and transformation, which is the business group, one of the business groups. And he said, Hey, I'm looking for an engineer to sit on my design team. Uh, would you be interested? And so I was like, heck yeah, absolutely. I want to learn more about design. And so a year after I started at IBM full-time, I moved onto that team and I got the coolest project. So I worked on Linux on Power Developer Portal. So I got to work with WordPress and PHP. I worked on a Salesforce solution for IBM support, but then my last project was working at IBM Quantum. So if you Google the IBM Q network site, I built that from start to finish using Vue.js and I'd never used Vue. So it was kind of like a challenge, I guess, but that like getting to work on the quantum computing site, uh, the team and like go to Armand, New York and like see like these quantum computers was so cool. Okay, I have a quick question here. Um, Vue versus React. What is your view on that? <laughs> I, <laughs> that was horrible. I hate you a little bit. Um, <laughs> it, it was not as good as mine. Um, Definitely so, not as good as Ada Lovelace. I got to admit that. Mm. Vue was so refreshing to switch to from Dojo and Angular 1 because mm -hmm. I was using both of those. Um, why I loved Vue was it was so beginner friendly. The documentation in the community are so welcoming. It was very, very easy for me to get up and running. When I switched to React, it was because I was joining LogMeIn. They were using React Redux TypeScript. When I started React, I hated it. It I'd always been told, oh, it's a lot more powerful than, than Vue. Um, and now that I've used both, I wouldn't say I will never use Vue again, but once you fall in love with React, it's kind of hard to want to go away from it again. Um, I do find it's a larger community, but the community itself can be harder to feel welcome in sometimes. It, it kind of depends. Interesting. Um, I think the Vue community, in my opinion, has always been very, very welcoming to beginners. React is a little bit harder. It feels like because it's been around longer, it's more widely accepted you are going to get people who maybe are more gatekeepy and that for me was hard but just looking at like the syntax how i architect applications i love react and i i don't think i would go back i wouldn't say never go back to view but the problem is i can't use both like if i use react originally i was like i'm going to keep doing view in my side projects but you get so confused between syntax like for me i need to pick one or the other i can't work on both simultaneously i get so confused yeah, that's fair enough. Do you, do you feel like there's any parts of you that you're missing in React or, or vice versa? Is there anything I that sticks out? If, if, if not, that's fine. I feel like some of the directives that Vue has were really useful for me, but to be honest, I don't remember enough about Vue to, to yeah, accurately like compare the two. Yeah, because it's been like uh, three years or so since I've used it. Yeah, right. Fair enough, fair enough. So it's probably also evolved a lot since you've used it, to be totally yeah. fair, because it's, like, changed <laughs> yeah. a ton. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah kind of hard question. But I, I would say, like, in, in terms of tooling and community at this point, I think um, if we're talking scope of both of them, they both have a very large community, very good documentation, very good tooling. So, like, for beginners, I always suggest it kind of depends what people are looking for. Like if you're looking for to pick up a JavaScript framework, that's easy to learn and generally a great community to work with. I recommend Vue. If you're looking to get hired as fast as possible, I recommend React because there are more jobs that use it. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's how it used to be, but, but I feel like Vue is catching up so fast now that it's like that gap is definitely closing. Um, but think about, I mean, there are so many companies that exist today who are already using React because at the time it was the hot new framework, um, they're not going to go migrate over to Vue. Like it's the opportunity cost is not a great yeah, one. Yeah, right. So I do feel like in general, there are more React jobs, but for how long? I'm not sure. 
that makes total sense. That's actually a great insight. I, I, I didn't know that because I've never actually looked at view jobs. Um, so that's super fascinating. Okay, so back to the storyline. Sorry for that intermission. You're at IBM, you do all of this cool stuff. You built the IBM Q network website um, with Vue. Now, what's the next step for you? Where do you go from there? So from there, um, I, let's see. I was working on the Q network site and I, so I met a guy at the time we were working together on the IBM support site and it was basically like a super fast whirlwind romance where like he was in Germany. So for me, I like knew I didn't want to do long distance. And so like we were flying back and forth, but that was no, no one likes to do long distance. And so for me, I always wanted to live in Europe. That was something I had always dreamed of, but never had a reason to. So at that point I was like, you know what, I'm going to move to Germany. And so I told my manager, look, Hey, I'm moving to Germany by May or by February, whenever my lease was up. Um, and they basically were like, yeah, well, you can't work remotely. So I, I actually applied to IBM in Stuttgart and Brabagen and I got through the whole process and they wanted to hire me, but they didn't have like a hiring ticket. So at that point I was like, all right, I need to look around. So I searched around and then logged me in, took a really great chance on me. They helped me with my visa. They took really good care of me. And like, I'm always going to be really grateful to them for that. So that was the next step. You joined Logmean. What, what, what are you working on there? Or what have you all? Oh, so I joined the GoToMeeting product team. So I was working on GoToMeeting. Um, we worked a lot on the next generation. So GoToMeeting used to look a lot different. Um, and if you look at it now, we've completely dismantled the sidebar that used to be there. It used to be like the sidebar along the edge. Um, but now we've dismantled that and made like three floating buttons at the bottom. So it's a little bit more modern, um, has better audio quality and whatnot. So I was on that product team for a year. Uh, and at that point I was like, oh, I heard they have a design system, but like, they only have, uh, design components, like sketch components. Like, why aren't mm -hmm. we putting any developers on this? And so, um, they finally moved me over to the design team full time. And I led the design system that they were building internally. Um, but the problem with that was I was doing a heck of a lot more project management design. Like I was doing project manager design and development work all together. And most of it was project management and it was just too much. Like I really wanted to get back to development work. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been doing for the past year and a half, I would say. Oh, wow. So how's the design system evolved since then? Is it actually used yet? How mm -hmm. many, is it, is it big? It is, it like... is. Yeah, it is big because we have <laughs> so many different <laughs> products. So we've got um, in our business unit, we've got GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, GoToConnect. Those are the big three. Um, and go to connect came from Jive, which was its own entity. Like that was an acquisition. Go to connect was using a mix of like Vue and React. Uh, it, it was kind of like um, there were so many different technologies being used. And so it was very, very overwhelming. But currently where we are, we have a learn a mono repo and we have different packages. So we have like a plain CSS. We have a plain like web components JavaScript that pulls in that CSS. So if people just want to use the styling, they can do that. We've got a style components. Uh, well, okay. Technically it's a motion with chakra, I think. Oh no, Sorry. I'm going to stop yeah, this interview right here. This doesn't work. <laughs> it's over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no. Um, yeah. And then we have, a, we have a material UI theme because some of our dev teams were using like Google's material mm. design to build out components. But chakra has really been a huge, huge, like, propellant of our system um the work that shagun has done on chakra ui is incredible um so yeah we've got a bunch of different packages uh with many different code bases so it's it's a lot <laughs> but, but it's I, good it's good now we've got it integrated to all these different products and when i started there was no code at all so yeah that's awesome i i, I was just thinking like the, the way you've basically met the developers where they're at right by supporting yeah. all these different versions is really important because i think a lot of times you have to Design, exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of times design systems end up being like this promised land, right? Like, oh, this is the tech stack that we want to be using in like 10 years across our entire company. Mm. And so people build a design system, but then you never get there. And then nobody uses the design system. Well, right? that, so was, I think this, that was a hard lesson that I had to learn because I originally wanted to do things the right way. I wanted to build one design system that everyone uses and migrates to. And then I realized, because I was talking to my friend Christian Schroeder and he sat down he goes look you've got one of two things can happen right now he goes you can build this the way that you want but you will not get developer support or you can get all of us to help you but you have to let us build it our own way and we'll have several 
like several packages. And for me, what was more important was unifying all these different product teams and getting better developer collaboration than me coming in and building this whole thing in isolation and no one uses it. So it's not ideal, right? Like I wouldn't, you wouldn't normally build a fully fledged design system on top of Google's material UI because they're opinionated <laughs> in their styling, right? It's kind of like you're building a design system on top of a design system. Like, um, but you got to pick your battles, I guess is the biggest takeaway. And uh, yeah, it's doing well so far. Nice, nice. All right. So you've, you've spent one and a half years building this design system and now you're off to Spotify. Do you know mm -hmm. what you're going to be doing there? Is there any plan for that yet? Yeah. Have you been hired for a specific position? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be working on the consumer experience. So basically anything the consumer touches product wise, I believe that's what I'm going to be working on. Probably the web stuff, obviously, because I'm not like a native app developer. Um, but like any um, like HTML embeds that people use to embed their players, um, like what we're using, uh, we're rebuilding our podcast site with Squarespace and there's a Spotify um, embed with Squarespace. Um, so stuff like that, um, you know, the web player and things of that nature. Nice. Uh, what is that podcast you're talking about? I guess we should mention that too for everybody that doesn't know it. Because it's a freaking <laughs> yeah, fantastic yeah. podcast. I should, I, oh, I should say. Oh, thank you. Yeah, actually. So it's called the Ladybug Podcast. It's just me and two of my lady friends. And we talk about code and career. We just had Kim Maida on uh, from Gatsby, head of developer community Gatsby, um, which I thought was a really fun episode to learn more about Gatsby, but also to learn more about dev advocacy. So Yeah. I mean, working with Kim, she's done an amazing job. And that episode really highlighted mm -hmm all of the careful thought that she puts into into her work, which is just mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Um, I love Kim, and that was a great episode. Yeah. So yeah, definitely <laughs> listen to the podcast, uh, Ladybug Podcast. We're actually going to link that at the end. Um, so recently, you've sort of made waves by um, publishing an ebook, right? And why don't you tell us how that came about and what the story there is? How did that happen? I feel like making waves is a bad thing. Maybe that's my English. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take my ESL card. This is English as a second language. If it's a bad thing, I didn't mean it in a bad way. Uh, no, you've recently, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. I've made waves. Okay, so um, yeah. So <laughs> I once I landed a job offer from you know a dream company for my dream role, I kind of sat back and I realized like how far I guess I'd come in five years of doing this professionally. And not only that, I had passed my Google technical interviews and gone to the hiring committee and was like waiting to hear back from them about a job offer. Um, and it was kind of at that moment when I realized, holy crap, like I've somehow become quite good at interviewing. But it's a skill that is very difficult. Um, there are a ton of resources, but the biggest problem is that Interviews typically test data structures and algorithms knowledge, which is not something that developers learn if they are self-taught and or come from a boot camp. It's typically only something you would see in a computer science degree. And as someone who came from a computer science degree and who struggled with those concepts for five years afterwards during interviews, I felt like I wanted to give back to people, especially that so it, the catalyst was really, I saw how many people were getting laid off during um, the coronavirus situation and I wanted to help others. And I just word vomited, you know, 270, 217 pages worth of all the skills and knowledge that I thought I had learned from the past five years. And in the hopes that like it would help at least one person get a job or feel better prepared for a job. So that was kind of my justification. Is it fair to say that the book is almost like a computer science education for people who didn't go to university? To the no, sort of not at all. Yeah, but not I mean, all. I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. But like in 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 the sense that it helps you pass the interview the interview stage of it, these big tech companies. Yes, it covers the skills from a computer science degree. Yeah, that exactly. You will directly need to apply to a technical interview. But yeah, I wouldn't say it's comparable to like all the skills. Um, but that being said, there were also some gaps in there, right? Like I originally was going to include tries as a, a data structure in there, which is a really cool tree type of data structure where you can use it for search algorithms. So it's probably how Google stores their search algorithm is in a try where um, you have different paths you can take for different words. And I originally included that, but I did not code it. And one of the pieces of feedback I got from my friend Allie was like, well, if you're not going to code it, maybe just remove it because it could just be more confusing. But in the next iteration, I'm working with the Egghead IO team to turn this into a better revised book, but also a full-on, fully-fledged video course. Um, I want to cover 
literally all the things that you would ever encounter uh, in more depth. Cause this was really just 30 days of me trying to get out as much as I could, as fast as I could. Nice. So how, how many people have actually bought and read the book yet? Do you know that? Oh, great question. <laughs> um, I, you know what, let me check. Um, and I'm happy to, I actually posted this in the blog. We should link that blog. because I think, um, that was really cool. I'm just seeing if I could share my, if I share my screen, will yeah, everyone that works. see this? I'll show you my analytics. Um, oh, wow. I'm also gonna link your blog post, the most recent one, right? Yes. To chat. Um, so if you're watching this, look at chat. I just linked her blog post. Ah, it's on compiled.blog, which by the way is a fantastic domain name. Um, thank you. I love I found that. some really fun domain names recently, but I haven't migrated over all of my blog posts yet. Okay, so let me share my screen with you. Oh, you disabled attendee screen sharing. Too. Oh, I did. Hold on, I gotta fix that. Uh, here we go. Now I should be able to show you your screen. Nice. Okay, so this is my analytics panel. And I did put a screenshot of this in the blog. Basically, I had 3,800 sales. Um, now, this book was only priced at $10 per copy. If you wanted light and dark theme, which I don't know why I decided to do both. That got me in way over my head, but um, <laughs> 17 for both. Um, so it was pretty affordable. And for anyone who lost their job, I gave it to them for free. Like if they lost wow. their job. Not, I gave it to them for free. If people came from a country where like the conversion rate was um, not in their favor, I gave them a discount or I gave it to them for free. So I did give away a lot. Um, totally fine. Cause I really was not in this for the money. Um, I ended up around 40,000. Um, and Gumroad took, I forget how much of a percentage they took, but I think all in all, I ended up with about 37,000. Congratulations. Uh, That's sales. huge. Thank you. Yeah. I'm like super excited. And, um, their stats are pretty cool. They do mostly, you know, I had most of the sales in the U S it shows the majority came from Twitter, um, and things of that nature. I'm not sure what consumption is. I don't know what that means. Um, oh, it shows, uh, how many, like how people act, like access your data or access your files. Um, so yeah, I think it was massive. It was a massive first release. It was massive for a self-published book. Um, but to be fair, a lot of that was attributed to two things. One, there was such a market need for this, but two, I had an absurd amount of followers already and I had a platform to market it to. So it's, it was definitely an outlier situation. Uh, let's actually talk about this. Um, you have 107,000 followers on Twitter the last time I checked, but it might've, it might've increased by another couple of thousand since yesterday. Um, <laughs> how did, uh, how, how did that come about? Was that a sort of concerned effort of yours? Did you focus on that? Did no, you try to make that no. happen or, or how did it happen? What do you think made that no, a thing? I, th I think it happened because I wasn't trying to make it happen. Like I see so <laughs> many people who they're like, I want to hit 10,000 followers by the state or let's make 30,000 happen. And that is such the wrong mentality in my opinion to have, uh, like, let's take the example of weight loss. Like, let's say I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay. Well, when I lose 10 pounds, I'm not going to be happy. Like if your goal is a finite number to me, I don't see that as fulfilling once you've reached that. Um, what's more fulfilling is having a goal to say, I want to be healthier. I want to live a healthier lifestyle. You're not focused on the number. And this goes back to the atomic habits book that I talk about all the time by James clear, highly recommend it talks about, are you on the right trajectory? Um, so focus on, are you pointed in the right direction versus have I met my, I want to lose 10 pounds goal. Um, so for me, it was never about, I want to gain X amount of followers. It was, I want to produce quality content consistently. And because of that, um, because of that and the shit posting I do, um, <laughs> I, th I think, um, it was a combination of those things. Plus I got very lucky and I got retweeted and or followed by some pretty large names pretty early on. Um, so it was, it was those couple of things put together. Here's a, here's a fun story from, this is, must be 2016. I was pretty new to the react scene. I was working on my own react project and my friend Nick Graf and I, we sort of played this game that we called get the Dan Abramov retweet where we essentially tried to figure out when Dan Abramov was working and when he was eating lunch and when he was taking breaks and looking on Twitter. So we could tweet our announcements and our releases so we could get him to retweet it because he had the biggest React audience at the time. Didn't always work. But okay. the thing is, if you have that big audience, once you retweet, if you retweet somebody, if you give them your audience almost, yeah, it's a really powerful way to um, enable them to, to share their projects way more widely, right? If you retweet something, 
suddenly a hundred thousand people are going to see it, right? Or close to, which yeah. is insane, right? Um, so that's very, very powerful and something that I think is definitely worth, I guess. He followed me pretty early on. And I think that's what did it is I think I maybe had 800 followers. Like it was really early. Uh, and he followed me, you know, retweeted some of my things. Same with Sarah Drasner. She also did that. Um, and those big people doing this definitely propelled things. But I did so, not play that. Is, is Jan Abramov working? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we didn't do that for very long, but we tried. It was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> but that, that actually leads to my next question. How do you produce so much interesting content? How do you make content that um, people find so interesting? What is your... What is your sort of, do you have a process that you follow or does it just happen randomly based on inspiration? Like, how does that work? Uh, I don't post content I think people want to read. I post content I need and isn't there. Um, mm. Or which are notes for myself. Because like a lot of times things, okay, let's be real. You're never going to post something original anymore. Like it's rarely going to happen. <laughs> but sometimes the way content is uh, created is not what suits your learning style necessarily. And so for me, I, there were a ton of tutorials, but maybe some of them just weren't good. And so I'd go work through these problems and I would write my process down. Like I'd write a tutorial for myself, not for anyone else, for me. Uh, and so, okay, that's not necessarily true all the time, right? Like some of these articles I'll write can be useful for new developers, but I think my whole mission statement has been create content that will prevent other people from having to suffer through the same problems I did. I love that. I love yeah. that. Have you Googled something yet and found an old blog post of yours? Has that happened yet? Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Not a blog post, but a tweet. And it is, how do I undo my last Git commit? <laughs> I <laughs> Amazing. need this all the freaking time. And like, I don't know why I don't know how to do that. Git? I suck at Git. I don't know what my issue is, but I have fucked up so many rebases, so Same. many merge conflicts. And it's to the point where like, I genuinely don't know how to use Git that well. So anytime I have to undo <laughs> my last commit, which happens a lot, I like have to go look at my own tweet. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> By the way, I don't think anybody really knows Git. I think Git is one of those things that some people, like you sort of know like the surface and you use like the 1% of it, but then there's like the 99% depth that you really have no clue about. I just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> We got to put I all these on a shirt. Pin. Oh. <laughs> I was just doing and then I lost my pen. <clears throat> um, huh. Just stop playing around with my pen. There's actually, oh, hold on. I'm actually going to link something else in chat. There's a great blog post by uh, Tom Preston Warner. It's called the Git Parable, I think. Hold on. Let, let me Google that. Oh, to make shit. Sure. You used to work for GitHub. I forget. Am I just over here like insulting you by association? No, not at all. I don't understand Git. I don't think. Most people like GitHub really deeply understand Git, except for the people working on Git. Those are absolutely fantastic. So oh, Tom God. Preston Warner, who was one of the co-founders of GitHub, one of the original co-founders, um, he wrote this blog post where he essentially explained Git from first principles, right? He basically starts off with, if you have no idea what any of this is, why do you need Git and how, like, what is the mental model behind it? I mean, and it's an actually a fantastic blog post that really helps help me understand, I guess, the, the foundation underneath Git that sort of makes it work, I guess, or the insights that are in it, if that makes any sense. It's fantastic. Yeah. Highly recommend reading it. There's also a friend and master's course by, it's Bianca or Nina, I can't remember, uh, front and, I can't spell, master's GitHub. There's a course on Git and GitHub. I'm going to link and that too. And Git, it's called Git in depth and it's front very, end. very technical. So it's by Nina Zacharendo. Oh, crap, I hate when I mispronounce people's names. But anyway, she even talks about like how Git blobs and trees are created, how SHA, SHGs, do people call them SHAs or is that just me? I have no uh, like idea. The SHA, like the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I know what you mean. She talks but I... about things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's also, oh, there's also oshitgit.com. Somebody just linked that in the chat. Oshitgit.com is freaking amazing. It's basically for when you fuck up things with Git and you got to fix them again. Uh, Wait, where's the chat? Am I missing this? I'm such a, am I a boomer? No, no, no. The, the chat, you, you, you'd have to watch the stream to see the chat. I am watching is, it. Well, then, like then you should see the chat. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, yeah, but like you posted three different things. Oh, no, you just posted the one. Oh, you're saying it's going to be on YouTube later. I got you. Yeah, oh, my yeah, God, yeah. I'm so old. Uh, no, you're not old at all. Um, exactly. So get back on topic. I got I to gotta get back on topic here. So 
Uh, hold on, where were we? Oh yeah, content. You 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 make content that you think you want. Uh, things you, yeah. you you you're sort of figuring out as you go. Um, what are you working on right now? What is the next big thing that you're working on? I guess the AK course is that sort of the content that you're creating right now. Um, yeah, we're working on that. Um, but I have I bought another domain because I just can't be stopped. Uh, it's called CSS Destructured. So my next project, I want to do oh. a fully in-depth CSS course. Um, but I'm going to be real honest. Like I was super productive for 30 days and now all I want to do is lay around and eat Pizza Hut and drink wine. <laughs> so like I'm not in a rush to build anything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I think for many people, productivity, or at least for me, productivity totally comes in waves. There's weeks where I'm super productive and I work like 120 hours. It feels like I just work all day because I'm super inspired and I know how to solve these problems and I just keep working. And then there's weeks where I just don't do anything and I just watch YouTube the entire week because I'm like, uh, oh, no. I can't really work. I feel you. I feel you. Also, I just realized I tried to join the chat because I'm like, I want to engage with the Zoomers. If that's what those people are called. Uh, that's my, my old last name. I got to change all this. I don't understand. This is okay. Let's talk about this for a second. People change names for many different reasons, but social media makes it freaking difficult to do so because it persists names even after you've changed them. So, like, there are many, like, I've updated my LinkedIn name and yet the URL refuses to let me change it. So, it's very confusing. Yeah. Um... Just saying. There's definitely a product out there. Gravatar is an amazing service that lets you yeah, set one but- avatar and then it persists across all the pages. I want the same thing, but for my entire profile. I want to update it in one place. I, yeah. And then it should update everywhere. Whether that's a name it's change, so a bio change, a link change, a location change, whatever it is, I want it to update immediately. So if you're listening to this and you're looking for a side project, that one's maybe a little bit difficult to figure out technically because you're going to have to build a bunch of integrations. But you've got two users right here. I would use it immediately. I would I would pay for this service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would probably pay for it too, to be Should honest. Should we do this? Should this be our next project? Yeah, you know what? We could turn this into a coding stream. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I've had I'm too done much for wine. the day. <laughs> <laughs> I only work if I drink wine. Oh, uh, that's not true. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so you're working on CSS Compiled, which is a book about CSS, I'm assuming. I don't know if I want to make it a book or a video course. I or, yeah, fair, enough, fair enough. Yeah. How yeah, do you... But I feel like... Go on. <laughs> how do I no. what? <laughs> how, 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 do you, how, how do you feel about video courses compared to books? Or, or written... I guess uh... visual versus written. That's a weird way of phrasing it, but you know what I mean. Do you, do you use video courses more or books? I do. I, I, so one creator I really enjoy is Tyler McGinnis because he mixes both of them. He mixes video content and follows it up with a long blog, blog post, which is great for many reasons. A, it reinforces the information you're learning. B, if someone is uh, visually, in, or I'm sorry, if someone can't hear if they're deaf, they can still read the content and not have to worry about whether or not the captioning is legitimate. Um, or like, let's say I'm in public transportation and I don't have headphones. I can still like take his course. So for me, I love the blend of the two, although it is twice as, it's almost twice as much work. It's like as a video creator, I tend to write all of my scripts anyway. So yeah. if I'm writing it anyway, like it's going straight into a video course. But for me personally, I, I tend to, to lean towards video courses. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. I, I think the one thing I like about text is that it can be searched. The thing I like about videos is that they're much mm-hmm. more engaging, right? If, if I'm reading something yeah. and it's like a really dense technical topic, I find I can, I can sort of understand it much better if there's like an instructor t- telling me about it and sort of walking me through it yeah. into different angles and like literally talking to me face to like almost face to face on the monitor, but that yeah. counts, right? Um, the nice thing about text is that it can be searched. So the combination really makes a lot of sense to me. Having both can be really valuable. Yeah, definitely. And like, there are different ways to do video content too. Brian Holt does an amazing job where he takes his courses and builds an application from start to finish. I love that type of course because I comprehensively take all the pieces and put them together into one thing. Um, West Boss in contrast and Egghead.io in contrast, their platform is centered around very small, digestible 
um, like co- pieces of content that are two to three minutes long and they're in isolation. So it's, uh, they're very different. I tend to lean towards the project-based lecture style videos. That makes sense to me. That's nice. There's actually another question that I wanted to ask about the book that you wrote. How yeah. did you write a book? Like literally technically, how did that work? How do you publish an ebook on the internet? Oh my gosh, I still don't know. Um, really, <laughs> but you published I'm an ebook on the internet. I winged this, let me tell you. Okay, so which was really, really ballsy and I don't recommend it. Um, the biggest problem I found was like, I couldn't find a ton of resources on how to publish an ebook, but I wanna take this moment to shout out and plug uh, Stephanie. I just retweeted her tweet. Morillo, I think, right? Yes. She just today published a book called The Developer's Guide to Book Publishing. I wish I had had this because I think it would have really helped me. Um, So go check out Stephanie's book, The Developer's Guide to Book Publishing. Um, I think it's 20 bucks, but it's it's worth it. And she's great. So go support her. Um, What I did is I opened a Google Doc and I vomited out all of my headings, um, like all the things I wanted to discuss. And I filled in the content from there. Once... I had the headings and the content. I migrated it into the Mac pages application. I had tried a lot of different online tools. Originally I was like, I'm going to use sketch. And then I quickly realized like sketch is a horrible, horrible (laughs) way to make an ebook. Please do not ever do it. I know Ali Spittle made her first ebook in sketch and we both like commiserate over how horrible that was. Um, because sketch is a design mockup tool. It's not meant for changing, uh, text but um so i tried a bunch of online tools and i hated all of them either the templates were not modern or they looked like every other ebook or they were very expensive or confusing to use and i hated it and then i found out the mac pages app has book templates and i was like okay cool so i took one of those and i customized it uh, to fit actually i i customize it to fit my portfolio aesthetic, which I've mm. subsequently changed because I have <laughs> problems. Um, so I, I, I wrote the content in Google Docs. I migrated it to the Mac Pages app. I then created all of the illustrations on the iPad using an Apple Pencil and Procreate, um, which was interesting because I'd never done either of those. And why not do it when thousands of people are waiting for this book? Um, and so then I exported all of those as PNGs in light and dark theme. <laughs> put it in the pages app and then exported those as, um, Oh my God. You had to make the graphs into light and dark theme as well. Of course. Jesus Christ. Do you know how long that took? And like, it, there were several times, so I ended up buying a couple of custom fonts for this because I didn't want to just use the traditional. Like I wanted a couple of things that were custom, so I I went on Creative Market and I bought a couple of fonts for like twenty bucks. Um, but there were a couple of times that I realized I need to change this font family. Like it's not readable, and so at that point I had to go through every single every single illustration and change the font. And then I had to re-export it as light and dark theme, and then re-add it to the book. And it was just like. Oh, I'm never doing this again. Oh my God. So were the light and dark mm-hmm. versions two separate themes? Is that possible with pages or were they literally copies, two separate documents? It was two separate files oh my that I had God. to maintain parity on. Yeah, it was not, not advisable and I will never do light and dark theme again unless it's a web-based book. That makes sense to me. Did, did people actually enjoy both of them? Like was there yes. an even spread between the sales or was there one that was sort of more heavily weighed? So... People, I did notice when I published the dark theme option, I had a lot more sales. People really loved that idea. That being said, some people found it a lot harder to actually read. So I did get some messages like, hey, I bought the dark theme, but actually I'm having a really hard time reading it. So I just sent them the light theme. I'm like, here you go. Like, don't worry about it. Um, But yeah, I think overall light theme was more readable for people, but they're def- it definitely boosts in sales. Interesting. That's super curious. I think people love dark theme, Yeah, but it makes sense that it's a little bit less readable for like long form text right like you have to be really careful Mm -hmm. so that doesn't happen that makes a ton of sense that's super interesting so (laughs) i can't believe that you hand drew the illustrations and then had to export them twice into dark and light mode and then had two separate documents for (laughs) for you know why i've just been like laying around in my ass eating pizza and drinking wine for two weeks like i just i'm so tired (laughs) yeah i (laughs) I don't want to do anything (laughs) yeah that sounds like so much work i feel sorry that you did that it was no, it's okay. I mean, I got my money's worth literally, which was not ever my intention necessarily. Like I wasn't trying to get rich off this book. Yeah, I mean, you, I was like, your oh. price is at $10, like, when I started which is this, like insane. When I started this, I was like, you know, maybe I'll make a couple thousand dollars to help 
towards my debt goal. And I never thought I would pay it off and have $8,000 left for savings. I never imagined that. Uh, so that was kind of, it still doesn't feel real, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm excited to turn it into a course for sure, because it's something that I wish I had had when I was interviewing. Um, but we still want to keep the book a book and we wanted to make it, um, like it's only going to go up to like $20 or something. Like it's still going to be decently affordable for people. And one of the things I'm definitely passionate about is like, if you got laid off, and you need to prepare for a job all of a sudden, like, I want to give that to you as a gift. Like I, I understand that. And I, that's something I really am firm in. And so I want to maintain that. That's yeah. absolutely fantastic. And I'm really, congratulations on paying off your debt. That, that's huge. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, a lot of Europeans don't understand it because in yeah. Europe, you don't accrue <laughs> debt. In the U S basically you need to have debt. Okay. That's not true. You Technically, you need to have debt to be able to buy a house someday and get a mortgage or to buy a car and have payments. Like you need to have a credit score. Um, and when I got really sick, like my first few months out of school, I was I had started at IBM. Um, I made the very, at the time, very stupid decision to get an HSA, a health savings account, which if you know anything about health insurance, I paid a very, very low premium. So every month I wasn't paying very much but I had a health savings account. So I had to put my own money into this account to use for health expenses. Well, guess what? When you get sick straight out of college and you have no money in your savings account and you have to go to the hospital and have surgery, emergency surgery, um, and it's out of network and you end up with 12 to $15,000 in medical debt and have no money to pay it. I mean, I was making $75,000 a year and I couldn't pay it. I, I mean, it got to the point where like the creditors were like, look, we're going to like we're really, we need our money. And I, at that point I was like, I put it on my credit cards. I'm like, well, I'll just pay it on here and I can pay it off leisurely because I don't want creditors coming to me like all the time. Uh, and at 21 years old, that is not fun. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's yeah. the U S kind of honestly messing yeah. up their healthcare system from a yeah. European perspective. Hearing that story is absolutely insane because there's no way on earth you're going to be in, in tens of thousands of dollars of debt <sighs> based on a medical emergency. And I was making a very good salary. I think like the median family yeah, the family sure. income in the US or at least where I was in Texas was like $50,000. I was making 75,000 straight out of college. Now, let me say, okay, was all of it medical debt? No, absolutely not. I was in a very emotionally abusive relationship where he actually had a credit card. It was my account. He was an authorized user and mm. he would go out and buy things with my card. And when we split up, I got left with that. So it was like, it was me being young and stupid and not making great financial decisions. And it took five years to pay it off, but I did it. <laughs> oh, that sucks. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy that you're out of that relationship because that actually sounds even Thank worse. Thank you. It was horrible. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. We could you're... do a whole episode about great relationships, couldn't we? That's, a, that's not a tech podcast, but. Yeah, we could. We could for sure. Um, oh. Or the US healthcare system for that matter. Uh, I feel like oh my god, all, all, all the European folks listening were like, "Jesus Christ, you have to pay for medical <laughs> stuff." Uh, yeah, you I do. saw this. I saw this thing where like this woman went to the hospital to have a baby, and she was reading. First of all, it's one of the only countries you cannot get a quote from a hospital to say it's going to cost this much money to have a baby. It's like one of the only countries you don't know how much it's going to cost. That's and just this ridiculous. Woman was reading you're, you're, through her itemized bill. Oh my yeah. God. She I mean, realized, guess what? They had charged her for holding her baby. What? Yeah. Like she had to pay money to hold her own baby. What? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that is such a strange concept. Not only are you buying something where you don't even know the price and they can basically tell you anything afterwards. But you're also paying for the ridiculousness of holding your own baby. How does that make any sense at all? It's such a, no, it's a huge scam. I, I like don't know enough about the politics to even offer a solution at this point. But I will say I had surgery in Germany, like right after I moved here and I was in the hospital for four days and I paid 40 euro. Yeah. <laughs> it was cheaper than a vacation. All right. Yeah. That's, that's what I would expect in Europe. Ah, all right. Back to tech. Uh, what's your... <laughs> Next step, you're, you're joining Spotify. What are you going to learn? What are you looking forward to digging into? Apart, I guess your book is that, or, or CSS course, is that a fair? Nah. 
that's a fun that's a fun side part i don't care about that right now i'm like um it's so bad because i'll go through moments where i'm like i i love everything i'm super passionate and other moments where i'm like i'm gonna quit and just be like a librarian um <laughs> no i i'm really excited to get back to react redux and typescript because that's what i used at log me when i started i love that stack personally it took me a long ass time to understand redux that was really hard for me and don't even get me started about rxjs and observables because ben is going to come for me i hate I hate RxJS. I will never like it. Um, but I, I hope Ben's watching. <laughs> this, no, this this concept of just like um, like observables and what is it? Declarative, imperative programming. I always mix them up, but um, confuses the hell out of me. So um, I'm very excited to get back to React Redux and TypeScript. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. That makes sense. That yeah. makes a ton of sense. That actually leads to another question that I have. You read a lot. Uh, you read something like 70 books a year, I think. Is that rough That was last year. I'm struggling this year because I, Reasons. okay, to be fair, I, I produced a lot of content this year. Like I made a course of LinkedIn. I made a course of front end masters. I published a book. Uh, I'm moving to a foreign country. Uh, so I've only read 32 this year. 32. We are what? Hold on. It's, it's the 19th of May. We're, we're not even six months into the year and you've already read 32 books. Yeah, I know. I, but that's low for me. So but you, to be you fair, read a lot. Question is that my my question was going to be what is your what are your top five books that people should read that are watching Ooh. or top three or whatever, whatever amount you want. Um. Okay. The Kite Runner has always been one of my all time favorites. The Kite uh, Runner. Khaled Hosseini. Yeah, it's like a really devastating book. It's about two young kids in Afghanistan and. Um, oh, fantastic! Very, I definitely won't read that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I did not hear what you said because Siri apparently like picks up on everything I'm saying and it like cuts out your audio. But in any case, I'm assuming it was a really mean joke. So I'm going to just, yeah, yeah fine. just go. On. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I loved that one my whole life. Um, I, I really like Brandon Sanderson a lot. He's very, very talented when it comes to large fantasy books, but also his science fiction books have been really good so far too. Um, so anything by him, I really like, Atomic Habits. I talk about it all the time. I love that book so much. The Power of Habit is really, really good as well. Um, I'm just looking. I sold a lot of books when I moved here from Texas. That makes sense. Um, I wouldn't carry a ton of books halfway across yeah. the world. <laughs> I, I don't know. I like oscillate between um, like nonfiction, career-based books. And oh, here's a really fun one. It's called Humble Pie. It is a book about, it's a comedy about funny math errors that were made in the history, like history. Um, and like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. So we talked about one of this on the podcast, but there was, I think it was for Pepsi. They were in an ad saying like, oh, if you get X amount of points, we'll give you this really expensive military grade jet airliner. Because if you would buy like a pack of their soda, like you would get so many points. And they were like, they picked a, a really big number and it was like a few million or a few billion they didn't think about it. Well, some guy sat down and did the math and he was like, look, I can buy so much soda. This is actually achievable. And he did it and he spent thousands of dollars buying the soda, but like he ended up getting this like military grade jet. Like they went to court for this because the people at Pepsi didn't sit down and do the math to say how much money would it actually take to accrue this amount of points. They just picked an arbitrarily large number. So it's just a book about like uh, math errors that were made in the history of the world that are just really funny and i really that is that hilarious one. here's a fun fact that i think is true pepsi has one of the biggest <laughs> militaries in the world i think really? if i remember what? correctly yeah because the reason is that uh the russian um the country of russia uh back in the you know, like old olden days loved coke like as a as a drink but they didn't want to buy Coca-Cola. So they bought a ton of Pepsi, but they bought so much Pepsi and imported so much of it that they couldn't pay for it. And also Pepsi didn't really want their money because at the time it was like a closed off country and you couldn't really do anything with their basically paper play, play money, monopoly money. And so they paid Pepsi in military equipment. They would give them like fighter jets and tanks and all kind of random stuff like that to pay for the Coke that they were importing. Oh and so gosh. Pepsi actually used to have, I hope I'm right on this. If not, somebody's probably gonna call me out on chat. I'm actually gonna Google this. <laughs> uh, Pepsi actually used to have, at, at, at one point in time, one of the biggest militaries, the sixth largest military in the world. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Which is absolutely insane. Like how is that we even were watching, We were watching Parks and Recreation yesterday and 
there's an episode where they like recreate the model UN. And I don't know if you've seen Parks and Rec, but if you have, you know, Andy's kind of like the idiot of the group. He's super funny. And I think he was Kenya. Maybe that was his country. I don't remember. But in any case, he traded all of his country's military for every other country's lions. And by the end of it, he just had like a military of lions. He had no like actual artillery military. <laughs> he was like, he was like, I'm totally winning this like United Nations game because I have the world's lions. It's like <laughs> the shit that people trade for things. I don't so yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, one last question, and then I'll let you go on with your evening. What are you reading right now? Uh, great question. Or what's the so, last thing you read if you're not reading anything right now? Well, I read like five books? books at a time. So, um, Fair I am I just finished the audiobook for Launch by Jeff Walker about how to launch any product successfully. That was very useful. Um, I'm currently still reading The Stand by Stephen King because I wanted to read a book by him and this is supposedly the best one. It's 1400 pages and I hate it. So, but <laughs> I've already committed. I'm like more than halfway through and at this point I have to finish it. Um, and then I'm reading Make It Stick for our book club. But again, really, really struggling to get through that. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for coming onto the show. I think we're gonna... <laughs> leave it off here i'm gonna end the stream thanks for tuning in everybody if uh people want to follow you if they want to check you out where should they go uh twitter that i'm like super active over there all right i'm gonna link your twitter in chat um is there any last words any last thing you want to say i feel like we could just do a whole live stream about random shit that doesn't have to be tech related but that's definitely the only thing i have to say oh actually <laughs> somebody asked which book club do you belong to oh our ladybug podcast uh every season we do three books so each one of us picks a book that we want to read a career-based non-fiction book i picked outliers by malcolm gladwell ali picked make it stick uh and then kelly picked why we sleep which was incredible and highly recommend it nice that's great yeah. can people join into that book club yeah we have a goodreads group and we try to have discussions over there and we'll take the discussions or like the comments that people post in there and we'll like read them out during our, our episodes I am totally also linking the Ladybug podcast. Uh, if you want to join the book club or if you want to li listen to an excellent podcast, go check that out. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks for coming on the show, Emma. Thank this was you. really fun. Thanks for having me. Have a great evening fun. or day, everybody. Bye. Bye.